Okay, let's get started. Your reports should have been handed in by now. Today we have a visit from the AICHE group. Uh, we'll start out class with them. So especially the chemical engineers and maybe some of the materials people can perk up a bit. Here you go. Take it away, me. Hi guys, my name's Amy, I'm the president of AICHE here on campus, and we're just here to tell you a little bit about what we do. We participate with a lot of events on campus, and we also travel sometimes across the country for professional conferences, and we do competitions as well. So I'm going to hand it over to Justin to tell you guys about the ChemiCar competition, which is the big event that we have. Thank you, Amy. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Justin, as Amy just said. Uh, can you hear me okay? Am I microphone's being kind of silly? All right, uh, can all the chemical engineers please raise their hand? Wow. Yes, I, I would applause. I, yeah. Wow. Uh, so we have a lot of chemical engineers here. That's great. Uh, chemical engineers, AICHE is just for you. It's uh, the professional development for chemical engineers, American Institute of Chemical Engineers. Uh, some of the things we do. Uh, last year we went to Minneapolis, Minnesota to do the national conference there. We met a lot of uh, chemical engineering students from across the nation as well as some companies. Uh, we had breakfast with, I believe, the chief metallurgist of Barrett Gold and met some people from DuPont and some other large companies. Uh, there was also a nice grad school fair. Uh, this year we're going to Pittsburgh to do the same idea. and. We also are going to the regional competition in San Diego. So if anybody wants a nice trip to San Diego, just join up. And professional development networking, as I said before, we met the chief metallurgist of Barrick. And you get to meet all these different companies at these fairs. We also have a speaker coming today. Who is that speaker? OK. Um, well, we have speakers from companies every now and then. We're going to take a tour of the Starbucks plant near Carson City soon. So if anybody's interested in industrial processes, that's cool. And then the big thing is the, uh, the Chemi car competition. Uh, can anybody tell me how much they enjoy making a hovercraft? There you go. See, hovercrafts are awesome. Well, so are Chemi cars. All the chemical engineers, you're going to make one next semester. And if you want to make two, then you can help us make an even better one. Um, we did OK last year, and we're ready to do better next, this year. And now it's time for Nolan. Hi, I'm Nolan. Uh, hi there. I love you, too. Um, the chemi car is basically a car that has to be powered entirely by a chemical reaction. You make one next semester in Ravi's class if you're a chemi. If you'd like to make an actually good one that can compete, <laughs> hit us up. So we have meetings every single week, Wednesday, 6 p.m. at LME 316. Does anyone not know where LME is? It's on the quad. There's a mine cart thing in front of it. You go in, go to the right, couches, that's where we live. We're probably going to switch it over to bi-weekly bi meetings. But tonight, we've actually got a lot planned. Since we're hoping for a big meeting, we're going to have some cookies. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We're going to have people from McNair Scholars talking about a really awesome opportunity for certain students to go to grad school to get ready and to get paid for. We are going to have discussions about the chemi car. 
about Engineers Week later in the spring, what we're going to do for that. And we might even crack open CNN and watch Barack Obama and Mitt Romney yell at each other. So please, Kemi or not Kemi, stop by tonight, check us out, we're great. And if you have any questions, you can email Amy, you can ask me later for my email, or you can just show up at an AICHE meeting and see what we're up to. Any questions? Okay. Thanks, guys. Very good. Nice job. All right, I'm surprised in a good way. Usually, like five minutes after class, there's somebody trying to find a tactful way to run to the front of the room and sneak in, a, sneak in their report on top of the pile. All right, hasn't happened yet. Um, let's get started, though. Uh, reminders. I'm going to spend a little more time on this than I had in recent classes. Uh, obviously, your design concept report, the written part, the printed part, paper, is due five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago. Don't forget to upload it into Web Campus. So turn it into a PDF. The whole team doesn't have to do it, but at least one person from your team, that should be their responsibility tonight, or they'll let down the whole team. Uh, get that uploaded. Um, let's see. A reminder, no lecture, none, not this lecture, one week from today, won't be occurring. Uh, you will be probably quite busy preparing for your checkpoint number one, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, it's not there yet, but very soon we're going to be posting a self-study module on how fuel cells work and how batteries work. Uh, talk a little bit about the chemistries of them. Not to the level that you, a high school level of chemistry won't be able to follow. But uh, that should be posted uh, certainly by Monday, uh, but I think I'll actually have that posted tomorrow. So please take a look at that. Um, like we had for the other uh, self-study modules, uh, there's a quiz at the end of it. Uh, I don't know if you've had a chance. I have posted uh, grade forecasts, and those grade forecasts will be available essentially for the rest of the semester. So what do I mean by that? We, in the, with the web campus, once we have graded something, your overall course grade will be updated, our prediction of what your grade will be. It's not going to be in a letter form, but in a number form, okay? So like a zero to 100 percent. And if you click on it, you should be able to see the overall class average, the class median. I don't know that you can get the highs and lows, but uh, you can get a, a measure of how you're doing compared to everybody else in the class. And this should be updated continuously for the rest of the semester. So I think the class average right now is like an 85, 82, something like that percent. Um, but we've only actually graded about 150 of the 1,000 points. So we're only about 15% of the way through the, the, the semester when it comes to the, the, the things you're getting points for. So, but those will start to pile up quickly once we start having checkpoints and these other activities going. So you can check that. It should be available for the rest of the semester. Um, let's see. Please check out the soldering video before your skills lab this week. Some of you have already done that, so it's not so much an issue. And the safety quiz. I notice uh, there are quite a few people who haven't even started the safety quiz, let alone done part two um, and, and finished that. Um, I don't know how you're going to deal with this week in skills lab. You can't do the skills lab. You won't get credit for it if you don't take the safety quiz. So right there, that's going to be like 30 points that you're losing. So you've got to take care of that. OK, first clicker question. Did anybody know you could actually do this? I'm kind of curious what the answer is going to be. I'll talk about it in a second. So you've been giving us information in CatMe. Now you can start seeing some of those responses. They're anonym anonymized, whatever the word is. Uh, but you can start seeing, essentially, feedback. Right? So in this main room here, 40% of you said, yes, you, could, you knew you could do it. 54% say you don't really care? Did, did I get these backwards? No, I really don't care. Oh, I got these backwards. I didn't know that you could do it. All right. But still, 7% of you said you don't care. All right. Just to be clear, what I'm talking about here is if you were to log into Catme, uh, this is a bit small, you can see a summary 
of the results that are in, in, your, in your team. You can get a, an idea of how you rated yourself and how that compares to how your teammates rated you and also what the average rating for your entire team was. And this will be for you know, your contribution to the team's work and, and all of the categories that you're asked to do. Please look at this in the spirit in which it's intended. Nobody's trying to screw over their teammate here. That's really not the way it works, right? We're trying to be constructive and honest with yourself and with your teammates. And if you, what we find most often is that people are too harsh on themselves, right? They, they, they rate themselves as you know, average when their teammates thought they were doing really good. You might find it in the other direction, but please take a look at this and, and take it seriously. We, uh, we find it as a, a pretty useful tool. Okay, I already talked about these grade forecasts, so I recommend keeping an eye on that throughout the semester. Notice how I put the Fs all, all at UNLV. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. For your skills labs this week, do not forget your safety glasses. We made like 40 bucks today, and for people, one dollar at a time who forgot their safety glasses. So 40 people forgot their safety glasses. We had like five sections. We had a lot of sections today. But um, please bring your safety glasses. Otherwise, it'll cost you a buck. Right. Also bring the parts from your rental kits, the, uh, the relay boards and things like that. These are the actual things that you're going to be learning how to solder on. If you don't bring them, you can't do the activity. And we don't have spares. So someone on your team has to remember to bring that in. Any questions about this stuff? I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, you're going to be bringing your rental kit parts this week, and I think you're also going to need at least some of it next week for your fuel cell lab. OK. Coming up is checkpoint one. This is one week from, well, one week from tomorrow. Next clicker question is to see whether you've been paying attention as to what this actually involves. How far through the design process, or through our course's design process, do you have to be for this checkpoint? All right. Select fans and batteries is number four here. Yep, that's correct. But some of you were a little behind the curve. So that's principally the difference between your report that you hand in today and the checkpoint, which is next week. You, this week was estimations, calculations. You have to show us so you know how to do all the calculations. But estimations, but maybe you hadn't finalized your choices of what you want to buy. Next week, you have to give us all that. You have to tell us how you're going to get off the ground, how you're going to lift. You have to give us a game plan. It's just a rough game plan for how you're going to use your fuel cell to get the propulsion done. Okay? That's another key difference. Right? We're going to be paying pretty close attention to what your fuel cell is going to be doing next week. But you should have made selections of what fans and batteries you're going to get. You should be showing us the actual part numbers. You should, you know, in other words, you should have done some homework and figured out that this is available from this company for this price, and they have it in stock. Okay? That's, we're effectively going to be looking for those things. And we are not going to sign you guys off on beginning to buy, to start to buy your things, let alone actually build. We're not going to sign you off on that stuff until you've showed us that everything up through number four is A-OK. -okay. Okay? So please keep that in mind. For the most part, the thing you hand in today for your report, you can cut and paste a lot of that stuff and give it to us next week for the checkpoint. We expect there to be updates and revisions to make sure the numbers are all up to date and finalized rather than just estimations. But by and large, the things you hand in today will go a long way towards what you have to hand in at your checkpoint. OK. Used parts. Once you pass your checkpoint, you will be, you will be able to buy things. Many of you notice that we have a couple of tables in the lab where there's all sorts of fans and battery packs and things like that on them, but we're not letting anybody actually buy them yet. That's mainly because you have to pass checkpoint one before you allow you to buy anything. However, you can put reserves on them. I recommend that uh, this is another motivation to get to the checkpoint early. The earlier you pass the checkpoint, the earlier you can start buying these. And these are usually about half the price of the stuff you'll find online. Prices vary. They're, the prices are set by whoever's selling them from the students from last year. Uh, but uh, you can't buy them until you actually pass the checkpoint. Okay. So 
just sort of summarizing this checkpoint stuff, next Thursday and Friday, all day, you can show up anytime you want. You can show up at 6.59 in the evening. Good luck with that. Um, I recommend getting there early in the day. The doors will be open, uh, and anybody who's in the room by 7 o'clock will grade you. If you're not in the room, we're locking the doors, and you're not, well, you get the idea. Be on time, okay? Um, let's see. 25 points for that one. Uh, the descriptions of what we're looking for, the actual grade sheet that we are going to be using is posted on the website. Last year, we gave out the grade sheet, and only like 10% of the students actually bothered to look at it. And we were shocked when we were doing the grading. It's like, geez, all you had to do is put the file name this way or whatever, you know, those types of things. Follow the rules, and you can get a whole lot of points. Um, don't forget about that. Uh, let's see. And that's about it for the checkpoints. OK, today's topic, whoa, what happened here? Bear with me one second. There we go. So today's topic is the fuel cells. I know many of you have uh, not had concrete ideas on how you're going to actually use your fuel cell in your project. The report, we ask you to talk about it in generic terms, but I think today we're going to get into a little bit more of the details, an overview, I should say, of, of the fuel cells. And you really, I guess, are going to get into the details in your skills lab starting next Tuesday, where we're going to give you your fuel cell. You're going to learn how to turn it on, power it up, whatever, how to provide the, the fuel, how to uh, make measurements of how much power it's able to generate. And hopefully at that point, you'll get a feel for exactly what it's capable of, and more importantly, what it's not capable of. I'll tell you right now, this won't even come close to powering a lift fan by itself. It just, it just can't work. So if you're required, and you are, if you're required to use a fuel cell to either power or control your propulsion technique, you're going to have to get clever about it because you can't just use it to power a huge big fan. You have to do something a little bit more fancy about that. So how do they work? Well, a fuel cell is analogous to a battery. For the purposes of this course, you can think of it almost like a battery, except it's not completely self-contained where all the energy is stored on the inside. A fuel cell delivers energy like a battery does, but it derives that energy from a fuel source and typically an, an um, a material like air or oxygen uh, it uses as um, an oxidant source. Now, the fuel that you can use in a fuel cell is not burned the way we think of fuels in a car or in, in a heating system in a home or something like that. The fuel is actually used in a chemical reaction and not so much uh, a dramatically exothermic one of, of burning something. Okay? So that's how it d differs from, from, other, fuel, uh, from, excuse me, from under, other energy systems. And the fuel we use is hydrogen. Now, as it turns out, hydrogen will burn, but we're not going to be burning it in our fuel cells. Hydrogen is actually, well, it's a rocket fuel. They use it to lift the space shuttle off the ground, for example. It's, it's quite combustible, but we aren't going to burn it. If we burn it in this class, we probably are earning an F in the process. Okay? So it's a safety issue, if you recall. We don't burn things in this class. But we'll use it. It's fairly safe, and as long as we don't do stupid things, uh, it, it, it'll be safe. So, before I get into how a fuel cell works, I just want to sort of contrast it with other common mechanisms or other common ways of, of using fuels. So let me dim here. Okay. There are lots of kinds of fuels. And to be honest with you, the combustion of fuels is one of the most energy efficient ways of getting energy out of a material, burning it. That's, that's usually the easiest way. It's easy, and it's also pretty efficient. There's a lot of energy stored that can be released through combustion. Um, the, only, the only real way to get more typically is out of nuclear processes, nuclear reaction processes. So while an engine, an internal combustion engine as shown over here, or uh, in, in this case here, it's, a, it's not an internal combustion, this is a turbine, um, we can generate electricity by burning something because this heat can be converted into other forms of energy. In, in an internal combustion engine, i.e. not what you're allowed to use in this class, you you put a gas in a small chamber, and you mix that gas with a fuel, and you light it on fire. And the heat that gets generated causes the gas in there to expand. Remember the ideal gas law? You add heat, and the gas expands. But when that gas expands, it pushes a piston out of the way. And through a mechanical linkage, you are able to create that or cause that expansion of the gas to push the piston and cause a shaft to turn. And this is the motor shaft or the drive shaft or the crankshaft uh, in, in your car. This is a very efficient way of, of doing things, 
but it's got a lot of shortcomings, like it's got a lot of moving parts. It's, it's a fairly complicated device and engine uh, to get it to run with high efficiencies. So we aren't going to work like that, and we aren't even really concerned about generating heat. Okay? You don't have to have internal combustion. In the case of an aircraft engine, the, the jet fuel is ignited. Uh, the, actually, I don't really want to go there. This isn't a, a typical jet engine. The, in this case here, you have air flowing in. You have an ignition process working midway through the engine that causes an expansion of, of the gas. And the blades of this fan essentially start rotating. Okay? It, it's a much more complicated thing to, to visualize than we have for the internal combustion. But once again, it is this heat that's causing the expansion of the gas. And we're not going to really work with that uh, in our situation here. We have a chemical reaction that is causing all this. Technically, it's an electrochemical reaction. We're not going to go into the real details of how the chemical reaction works. That's actually, that's really beyond chemistry too. Um, but uh, some of you, the chemical engineers and maybe some of the materials engineers and maybe even some of the uh, mechanical engineers might be working in, in these areas. But by and large, it's a, uh, a fairly simple device that I'll get to in a moment that uses a chemical reaction between a fuel, in our case hydrogen, and an oxidizer, in our case air. Just atmospheric air, so it's fairly simple. Nothing burns, okay? Fuel cells take a lot of different forms. I showed you a couple of weeks ago the fuel cell we're using in this class, the one that we have in the lower right corner of, of this figure here. Um, it's about two inches on a side, it's fairly small, generates all of about 1.2, 1.5 watts, right? Not a lot, that's a pretty dim light bulb when it comes to, to energy, okay? But real world fuel cells, things that are not made student proof, robust and almost unbreakable, Real world fuel cells are maybe, for example, the size of a small vehicle. You might find this sitting outside your house. This would be a fuel cell stack that you'd be uh, using to maybe power your house or maybe uh, uh, in a small apartment building. Um, fuel cells in the upper left corner over here, you can't get a good size scale here. The larger ones may be two feet long by a foot and a half tall. Uh, that would be about the fuel, size, fuel cell size that you'd use to power a car. Okay? So they can vary. In, over huge ranges, and a fuel cell that will power a whole neighborhood will fill up about maybe the size of a, of a semi, okay? So you can get a feel for how large these tend to be. These are just the fuel cell stacks. Doesn't actually include the fuel tank where the fuel is stored. Just as we have with cars, we have fuel tanks and cars. When you have a fuel cell, you need some place to store at least the hydrogen, and in other cases, you also need to store the oxygen. We're not using oxygen, pure oxygen here. We're using air. So Fortunately, we don't usually need a special place to, to hold the air, but if we were putting a fuel cell on board a spacecraft, we'd need to provide the air also, right? But in our case, we just get it from the room. So, as I said a moment ago, there are electrochemical reactions um, that you combine the fuel with the oxygen and produce, instead of heat the way we had in an in internal combustion engine, you are producing electrons, if essentially, elect char charge particles, in our case electrons, that are produced at an electrical potential that's higher than the, than, though the anode and the cathode has about a 1.5, roughly, volt uh, potential difference. This is more advanced stuff. You don't have to worry about that. The idea is it generates a voltage and a current, and you can harness that current to do work, right, to, to power a motor, for example, okay? And the fuel cell that we're going to be using here, there's a lot of different types of fuel cells, are called proton exchange membrane-based fuel cells. They're, Fortunately, one of the simplest types, and they use a nice and simple hydrogen as the fuel source. Hydrogen is a preferred fuel source for a whole bunch of reasons. It's got some downsides, but the, the, the major pros are it's abundant, right? It's, it's quite easy to extract hydrogen out of water, which is H2O, hydrogen and oxygen. Just by applying a small amount of electricity to water, you can split it up into hydrogen and, and oxygen, which coincidentally happen to be the two things that you need to power a fuel cell. So it's quite common to, for example, use solar energy to split water into hydrogen and oxygen, store it, and then later on you use those stored hydrogen and oxygen to power a fuel cell. Okay? That's one way to get electricity at night using solar cells. You use that solar cell when the sun's shining to generate the hydrogen and oxygen, and then you use that in a fuel cell at nighttime when the sun's not shining. Okay? So major benefit here is that fuel cells don't have any moving parts. That, this makes them rugged in most cases. You have to protect it, protect certain parts of the fuel cell to make it rugged, but the fact that there are no moving parts is, is, a, is a major benefit. So let me start this video here to 
give you a three minute overview of this stuff. Fuel cells can possibly power anything, from tiny microchips to cars to entire buildings and power plants. Getting the juice they produce is a complex process. Let's break down what they are and how they work from an expert, Professor Tom Fuller from the Georgia Institute of Technology. A fuel cell is a device that takes uh, stored chemical energy and converts it into electrical energy directly. Essentially takes the chemical energy that's stored within whatever fuel you have, it could be hydrogen, it could be methane, it could be gasoline, and then through uh, two electrochemical reactions it converts that directly into electricity. The major components of the fuel cell are the electrolyte, which is also a, a separator, so it keeps the reactants from mixing together. The next pieces are the electrodes, and these are catalysts where the electrochemical reactions occur. And then beyond that, there's uh, typically a bipolar plate, or again, sometimes called a separator. But this is a way to collect the current and also build the voltage from the cells. The fuel cell runs best on hydrogen. But hydrogen is not you know, available. You can't dig up uh, hydrogen out of the ground. You can dig up a fossil fuel and convert it uh, into a hydrogen-rich stream. Uh, but to do that in a fuel cell, you need to reform it and then clean up the, uh, the gases quite a bit before you can put it in a fuel cell. There are certainly fuel cells that have been looked at uh, to take gasoline, reform it in a vehicle, convert it to a hydrogen-rich stream and run a fuel cell. Uh, but that's, it's a very complex process and most people have decided that that's not the right route to go. There are specific challenges that, that are still present. Uh, one is that the volume of the fuel cell you know, is relatively large compared to the volume of an internal combustion engine. So you've got to fit this into the vehicle and, and that's always uh, hard to do. So you've got to really work hard to either get the technology better to make the fuel cell smaller or just package it into the vehicle. So this is a typical device that we use for laboratory testing. It's a single cell, which means it contains one, one fuel cell, so it generates around 0.8 volts, and if you wanted larger voltages, you have to put them in series. That's the ionomer membrane, that's the electrolyte and the separator, and then this black here is the electrodes, where the electrochemical reactions occur. And then on top of that, you just have basically hardware that holds it all together, so you can control these things. And this is a fully assembled version where we provide gases in and out of the cell and we have electrical connections uh, to take the power out. I think the, the, you know, the, the major drawbacks to fuel cells is, is their cost compared to competitors. They're providing things you're already getting today, so they have to do it either more efficiently or a lower cost, and so far they really haven't been able to crack that nut to get to the cost that's competitive with other devices. Okay, so that was probably quite a bit to get all in one, one dose. I'm going to cover that in a little bit more detail in a couple of slides. But um, I want to start out just by pointing out that fuel cells are, are I, I guess I'd call them current technology. There are lots of needs for improvements in fuel cells, but they exist already. We've been using them for decades. Uh, we use them to, in, in everything from the space shuttle to, I don't know, anybody see the movie Apollo 13? When the thing that, the thing that broke on it was a fuel cell. Okay? It, was, it was one of the tanks was leaking and essentially ruptured and blew up and caused all sorts of trouble. So they've been around a while. I mean, that, that was back in the 60s. So the, uh, the technology for fuel cells is getting a lot more attention recently, primarily because of the problems associated with hydrocarbon fuel sources, right? The, the oil, the natural gas, the things that we currently get our energy from are running low. So they say, at least m most experts say, we're not going to have them forever. When exactly we'll run out is the question. So we're looking for alternative fuels. And as it turns out, using hydrogen that comes from water as your fuel in a fuel cell is a, is a, is a pretty appealing idea. So lots of current research is going in, in these directions. But as you might imagine, there are a lot of challenges with using fuel cells, using hydrogen, because you know, we have a world that's full of gas stations right now, and that gas isn't hydrogen. It's something else. We have a, an infrastructure that's surrounding our technical ability to get petroleum out of the ground and deliver it to everybody in a refined state in various forms. And we don't have any of that for hydrogen. 
So if you were to go out and buy a hydrogen-powered fuel, hydrogen fuel cell car tomorrow, even though they sell them, the Honda FCV has been out for two or three years now, uh, where are you going to fill it up? <laughs> right? You better have a, a hydrogen fuel cell gas station nearby, and we don't have a lot of those. Okay? Making your own hydrogen is not such an easy thing. Getting it into your car would be a little bit more challenging. And frankly, most people don't want to have to make their own gas station just to be able to drive one of these cars. So the kinds of applications that we use these for nowadays are the ones where it isn't hard to deliver fuel this way. Like, for example, backup generators in buildings, backup generators at industrial facilities can run off of fuel cells. And if they have the, their own ability to make hydrogen on site and at industrial scales, it's a lot easier to do than in your own backyard, uh, then this is a, a feasible alternative. We use fuel cells in outer space ac ac um, applications a lot. We've been doing this for quite a, a long time. Uh, fuel cells generally can hold more energy than an equivalently sized and massed battery. So it has the benefit of, of being uh, more useful than batteries in many situations. Although the concept of a fuel cell has been around a long time. Making them small is what we're currently working on. There are designs now, and they're, they're only in the prototype phase, of having cell phones that have a small fuel tank in the bottom where you fill them up in the same way as you might fill up uh, like a lighter for, your, for cigarettes or something like that. They've got a liquid in them. You would put that liquid into the bottom of your, of your cell phone instead, and it would power your cell phone for a week or, or something like that. They, these types of technologies are being developed. Making them feasible, practical, affordable are where the current challenges are. Laptop computer power supplies, these have been around for a little while. And uh, airplanes are working on now. I'll actually do an example on that in a second. But before I get there, this Honda FCV, if my memory's right, it's pushing $100,000 and you have to live next to a hydrogen gas station. So it's got some limitations, but the performance of the car is good. In fact, the performance of the car is better than a lot of the, the bad reputation that electric vehicles got, say, 10 years ago. Electric vehicles have been around for a while, except you got to drive all of 30 miles before you had to recharge it. And that, as a result, made a lot of people not so inclined to buy them. Electric cars in, recent, in the past couple of years are getting a whole lot better, but these fuel cell vehicles have been designed essentially from the ground up to uh, have ranges of upwards of 350 miles and have power outputs that are comparable to a typical car nowadays, you know, over 100 horsepower, 350 mile range. So the designs are pretty clever. In order to make use of fuel cells, um, you have some benefits. One, you don't need a regular gas tank, and two, you don't need the transmission and the motor of the car. So you have lots of real estate in the car that you can work with, but these fuel cell parts are still bigger than we'd like them to be. So that's one of the challenges. We're trying to make these things smaller. For example, in this Honda, they have a three-motor design, but the three electric motors, right? The front, we have a pretty large-scale motor here, as, as well as the, the, well, the fuel cells located here. The gas tanks for the hydrogen are back here. Um, this engine powers the two front wheels, but there are small electric motors that actually fit inside their, each of the two rear wheels. So it's causing us to drive um, innovation in new directions where instead of having one centralized engine in your vehicle, you might have three or four different motors going to the different wheels. And this allows all sorts of additional opportunities for traction control, braking control, regenerative braking, things like that. Uh, you can get efficient use of electricity and recover energy while you're braking very easily when your motors are actually in the wheels. Okay, so there's lots of benefits. And I expect a lot of these technologies to come into play in other like hybrid electric vehicles and things like that in the near future. Question, I'll back. Does the electricity like, fade over, depending on how far you've gone? Uh, generally, no, uh, in these fuel cells. Uh, they, they generate electricity with, with fresh hydrogen, so to speak, and fresh oxygen, so that the, the performance is consistent throughout the entire duration. In a sense, it's just acting like a battery. And when it run, but except the major difference between a fuel cell and a battery is that batteries run dead. Fuel cells will always keep generating electricity as long as it's got hydrogen and oxygen flowing in. So, when you run out of the fuel, then it will stop. Yes? Does a fuel cell become less efficient the more you use it the way a rechargeable battery does? And the short answer is yes. That is one of the challenges we're working on nowadays. The, but batteries do this, so we're used to this concept. And the question is, can we get enough use out of it to make it economically feasible before you have to buy a new one? The hydrogen is dirt cheap. Okay, so the costs are going to come in. How frequently does it wear out? How frequently do you have to replace some component of your modular design? Remember from last week? 
uh, if you have a fuel cell, you don't want to have to replace the whole car. You only want to have to replace, technically, the, 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 the proton exchange membrane that's on the inside. So you make that modular, you pull out the old one, you put in a new one, and you'll refresh the capabilities. Kind of like putting in a fresh battery, or even a fresh rechargeable battery. Okay. Question? If someone were to what the car? If someone were to run into the car, would it blow up? Um, yes, okay, and no. <laughs> okay. If someone runs into the back of your car with a gas tank in the back of your car, and most gas tanks are somewhat close to the back of your car, you have risks, okay? So an engineer can look at this and brutally say, this is the problem, it's flammable, right? Remember the Hindenburg, right? You know, <laughs> flames everywhere. Oh, the humanity. So things can burn quite easily. So one of the challenges that we are working on, this is a major area in materials engineering, is finding ways to store hydrogen safely. If you store it in liquid form, that's pretty safe. But the safest way is we've figured out that hydrogen, remember, that's a really small atom. Remember, it's in the upper left corner of the periodic table. It's got one electron and one proton and one neutron. Pretty simple. Okay? It's a small atom. As it turns out, hydrogen can soak into metal as if the metal were a sponge. You can soak like 15% of the weight of a chunk of, of a metal. You can put in that much hydrogen, and it just fits in between all the other aluminum atoms. Okay? That makes it pretty useful. We're developing methods to put the hydrogen in and get the hydrogen taken out in a way that makes it no, less, no more dangerous than a hunk of aluminum. Okay? Doing it cost effectively is what the current challenge is. So storing the hydrogen is a challenge. We can compress it into a liquid. We can store it in essentially armor-plated pressure vessels. They look like scuba tanks, except they're bulletproof. They're made out of the same technologies that they make armor around like, uh, you know, attack helicraft, Apaches and things like that, right? You have to make those things bulletproof, and I don't want to necessarily say these things will stop a bullet, but they use a lot of the same technologies to make them safe, so that if someone rear-ends you, you're not going to blow up the car, okay? Good questions, and these are the things that are actually affecting whether or not these things are available for an affordable amount of money. These challenges are why this car costs $100,000 instead of the equivalent of, say, $30,000 for a Honda Accord. Okay. okay, other technologies to just say how we're pushing the envelope on this stuff. This is an aircraft, this is a exper highly experimental aircraft that's designed to actually behave more like a satellite than an airplane. Right. It's a pretty interesting thing. It's, like, it's getting pretty old. In fact, one of my former grad students works for this company, Aero, AeroVironment. They look interested in developing long duration, high altitude airplanes that Essentially, you'll, you, they take off and they go up and they circle above one spot on the Earth for a month. Okay? They run on a combination of fuel cells and solar energy, and they're able to stay up there for long times. For, for example, you put a cell phone tower on board this thing. That'll have a heck of a line of sight. You're, you think the coverage in Nevada stinks. You put one of these things with a cell phone tower above it, circling above Elko, you're going to be able to communicate with that antenna from Reno, right? So that'll give cell phone coverage to all of Nevada. It's not like, I mean, it's not exactly like an Earth orbiting satellite, but it gives you a lot of the benefits. And you only have to have this thing come down and be serviced once a month, right? Obviously, there's no people on board. It, it's autonomous. So your autonomous hovercrafts, here we have autonomous aircrafts, right? This particular design has a wingspan of about 250 feet, which is, and, and notice, it's almost all wing. The top surface of it, the, these black checks, are all fuel, uh, excuse me, solar cells. Okay, so it's made out of a very thin and lightweight, flexible solar cell material. The entire top surface of the wing sees the sun, and it flies at an altitude of about 100,000 feet. It can go that high, it doesn't have to. The idea is you want it to fly above the clouds, right? If you're below the clouds, all those solar cells suddenly lose their effectiveness because the sun gets blocked by, this, by the clouds. So you fly it above the clouds, and during the daytime, the solar energy is used to split water. It's got a small tank of water inside one of these pods here. It splits the water into hydrogen and oxygen, which happen to be what you're going to use at nighttime to power the fuel cells. So during the day, most of the energy goes to powering the 13 electric motors. A little bit of the energy goes into splitting the hydrogen and oxygen out of the water. And at nighttime, those hydrogen and oxygen, when the sun's down, the solar cells aren't doing anything. It runs off of the fuel cells. Okay, so it's a pretty clever design. Daytime, solar, nighttime, fuel cell. 
And it, it, as a result, it can stay up there for long periods of time. And they have these types of ideas in mind, not only for Earth, but they're talking about maybe flying these things around uh, on Mars. I don't know if they will, but uh, the, the concepts have been brought up. This is one way to explore large portions of another planet that has some kind of an atmosphere that you can fly in. As it turns out, Mars is, has a very thin atmosphere, but it happens to be pretty similar to what our atmosphere looks like at 100,000 feet, which is where this thing flies. So, as far as civilian aircraft goes, this is, if my memory serves me correct, this is, still holds the record for the highest altitude, about 20 miles up, 100,000 feet. For reference, that's about triple the height of a typical commercial aircraft. Okay. There might be some military rocket-powered aircraft that can go higher, but frankly, there's not much air up there, so the whole concept of an airplane doesn't really hold. Right? The wing doesn't work when there's no air, so it really can't go up much higher than that. But anyway, fuel cells play a pretty good role in there. Now, we cover this in a lot more detail in the, in the reading assignment and in, your, in the um, module that you're going to be doing for class, but in, in brief, the way a fuel cell works is, is this. Now, we have our little device. Now, remember, this whole thing would be like two inches on a side. Everything in the middle between the anode and the cathode in the real world is probably going to be like a piece of cardboard thick, one millimeter thick. So I've expanded this image quite a bit. But the way this works is we have two sides. We have the hydrogen side on the left, and we have the oxygen side on the right. And when the process begins, we'll have hydrogen flowing in the inlet and out the outlet. But in the meanwhile, in between, hydrogen comes into contact with a catalyst that turns the hydrogen molecule, which is H2, into hydrogen atoms. And then once they reach the anode, the electrons are stripped off of those hydrogens, turning that hydrogen atom into essentially a proton and a neutron. We call it a proton because a neutron is kind of irrelevant in the process. But we've split off the electrons, which is where we're going to get our electricity from. Over on the other side, we have oxygen, which also is a diatomic molecule. And the catalyst will split the oxygen into separate oxygen atoms. And from here, Everything in the middle plays the important role. This thing in the middle, the proton exchange membrane, is our magic material. It's got some really cool properties, two important ones. First of all, it allows protons to pass through. So the hydrogen nucleus is essentially a proton. When you take the electron away from a hydrogen atom, what you're left with, chemically speaking, is essentially just the proton. The, nu the neutron doesn't play much of a role in most, most of these reactions. So we have hydrogen atoms that are able to pass through the proton exchange membrane. But the second useful feature of this membrane is that it will not let electrons pass through. And neither will it let the oxygen pass through from the opposite side. So we have the hydrogen moving through, but it forces the electrons to go the long way around. And when the electrons have to go the long way around, they are essentially at 1.3 volts, and they generate an electric current. So we harness this. We capture these electrons, and we, we force them into labor of turning a motor, turning a light bulb on, something like that. Okay? So it's forced labor of the electrons. When they get out the other side of our, well, our motor or whatever, they rejoin the hydrogen and the oxygen. So the electrons rejoin the hydrogen nucleus and form a neutral hydrogen atom. Two of those hydrogens will get together and bond to an oxygen, making H2O. Right? That's water. That is the byproduct of this reaction. The exhaust, so to speak, of a fuel cell is water vapor, pretty harmless for the environment. Although some people might say it's the worst greenhouse gas, but that's a topic for another day. So hydrogen and oxygen work together in this fuel cell. We keep the, the original source gases separated by this membrane, but the membrane happens to let through protons, forcing the electrons to go through an external circuit where we can harness the work and get, that we get out of those Oh, got five minutes, that, that, we, that we can get out of those electrons. So the fuel cell that we're going to use in this course is fairly wimpy, okay, compared to cars and airplanes and things like that. 1.2 watts. And if you recall back to the earlier top, topics we had in this semester, the power, which is a watt, a watt is a unit of power, is the voltage times the current. Okay? So another way of looking at this is you can, you can have 1.2 volts multiplied by 1 amp. 1.2 times 1 will give you 1 watt. So just in, as far as order of magnitude goes, you, you're not going to get a lot of current, but you can get some current out of these things. In reality, you're probably going to be getting less than 1.2 watts because uh, most people don't, most students at least, don't optimize their fuel cell system. They just sort of wing it. Okay? That's okay. But you can get up to 1.2 watts if you optimize uh, your system. Now, 
you're going to get your fuel cell in the, in, the, in the lab, you have to use it to do something that will allow you to control or power your propulsion system. Right? If you can get it to be your lift fan, great, but you, uh, you won't. It's, it's, just, it's nowhere close to being able to do that. Um, well, I shouldn't say you won't. You could, there's one way I know of that you couldn't use a fuel cell to power a lift fan, but it wouldn't last too long. Right? But what can you do? Well, you might be able to use it to power a small motor. I recommend going to, well, you can go to DigiKey and buy a, a one, one volt motor or a three volt motor or something like that for 10 bucks, or go to a dollar store and find a toy that uses one or two batteries, 1.5 volts or three volts. And that toy will cost you a dollar, take it back and you rip it apart and you take out the motor and you have a one volt motor or a 1.5 volt motor or a three volt motor or whatever that your fuel cell will probably be able to run. Okay? So that small motor can be used to do things like pushing a weight around. Maybe you attach that motor onto like a clothesline arrangement where you reel out a weight and you reel in the weight or I don't know. You can use it to the motor to push a, a rudder in front of a fan. Maybe you can use that motor to actually rotate a fan to turn in the forward direction and the backward direction for thrust. Okay? Lots of different options. Charging a capacitor, I might have time to go over this at the very end. Uh, you can look at those notes um, on your own. So the connections, you're going to have to be able to provide it. Hydrogen. We're going to be putting hydrogen in a small balloon, maybe about the size of a baseball. And you're just going to be opening up these vents to allow air in. We're not going to provide it oxygen pure in, in pure form. Okay? But you're also going to have to have electrical contacts that you're going to plug your motor into. Those are these two things on the sides. You'll learn about all this stuff in your, and you actually do it in your, in your skills lab. Okay? You'll be generating a graph that looks something like this. Quick question? It's got to be quick. The question is, the, 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 the hydrogen in the balloon will be at some kind of a higher pressure. Um, frankly, the pressure is almost atmospheric. There's a, there's a myth that the pressure inside of a balloon is much higher than atmospheric pressure. It really isn't. Okay? It, it's essentially at equilibrium. Uh, I can talk to you after class as to why that is. But uh, anyway, um, you don't need to have high pressure delivery of these. Some fuel cells will have high pressure delivery of the oxygen and hydrogen, but you don't actually need it. You just need a continuous supply. Okay. You'll generate a graph that looks something like this. You'll talk about that in class. So, things I want you to keep in mind. This fuel cell costs $200. We're issuing it to your team. If it comes back broken, your team owes us $200. These are fairly rugged. Last year, we only had one break, and it's because someone dropped it. Okay. And the thing that broke was actually the little port that we plug our tubes into. We, can't, we don't have anything to plug it into anymore if you break that. So, your goal is to, besides getting a hovercraft that works and all that, is don't break it. Okay. Fuel cells can dry out. We're going to give you this fuel cell. If it comes back to us not working, the most common problem is that you, you left it open to the surrounding air and it dried out. The membrane on the inside dries out and it stops working. Right? Keep it humid. Adding a little bit of a drop of water every now and then works just fine. Okay? We haven't had any permanently dry out yet, but this is a caution. So please do that. Do not use like beer or something like that. Okay? Use distilled water. Okay, and then finally, do not plug a battery into your fuel cell. Okay, applying electricity into your fuel cell can actually ruin it. Right? Never ever do that. Warning. Okay, so ah, forget it. I'll give you guys this one as a freebie. All right. If you one last thing, if you have a mind where you want to explore with supercapacitors. You can actually buy a certain kind of supercapacitor that will allow you to use your fuel cell for 17 seconds, for example, to charge up a capacitor that will deliver you one amp, which is quite a bit of current, for two and a half seconds. So there's about a five to one ratio of charge time to discharge time. This is the only way I know of to easily use a fuel cell to power something like a lift fan, a major fan. If you want to do something like this, come see me during my office hours. All right, we're done. <laughs>